Top British pop stars replace movie stars as the idols of the age and threaten to wipe out Hollywood's dominance of fashion forever. The mod moment turned 20th century fashion on its head, an explosion of color, whimsy, and playfulness in the middle of a tumultuous decade. Mini skirts, long hair on men, Nehru jackets, bell-bottom pants, go-go boots, men in tapestry coats and big ruffles, sexy women in cat suits. Coming on the heels of the conservative 50s, it was the most shocking style revolution of all time. And in case anyone thinks Maude is gone for good, watch out. The ultra-groovy shagadelic screen hero Austin Powers sparked a massive revival of mid-60s fashion and showed everyone that Maude is still where it's at. The second Austin Powers hit, The Spy Who Shagged Me, had a budget of 33 million, but it grossed a staggering 54 million on its opening weekend, the highest box office of any comedy in history. It's raked in over 200 million since then. Hello, Austin. I'm Basil Exposition with British Intelligence. These are serious numbers. I think everyone was a little surprised by the degree with which the world took Austin Powers to its bosom. <laughs> it, just, it was literally, you know, one, like, phenomenal. Maude is a gold mine for Hollywood now, but once upon a time it was bad news. From the earliest days of cinema, the silver screen had always dictated fashion. The glamorous women were film stars. And I think working class people looked up to them. They knew they could never be like that, but it was just a wonderful thing to go and look at, to dream. In the pre-mod era, the styles promoted by an aging Hollywood establishment left little room for fun, individuality, or for youth. The way young people dressed is very much um, a sort of miniaturized version of adult clothing. So adult was the norm, and then if you were younger, you had a little version of that. Clothes were very rigid, very stilted, and very set. You never were yourself in those days. You were always acting out the role that somebody else wanted. Golly. But by the mid-1960s, half the population was under 25, and the baby boom generation was ready for a style they could call their own. They got it in 1964, when four long-haired lads from Liverpool stepped off a plane in New York. The Beatles, I mean, forget about it. That was really the seminal year, I think, in 1964, with their Pierre Cardin suits and, um, and haircuts and great new music that Americans just really went wild for. And they were much more of an influence than any films of the time on, on fashions. Kids were no longer getting their style from the movie stores. They were inspired by the women that ran with the Beatles and the Beatles themselves. For women, the epitome of the new mod look was a skinny 16-year-old named Twiggy. There was this new being that was not a girl, not a boy. She did look like she might have come in from another planet. Very thin, even her body language was different. What happened to me was extraordinary. You know, I'd suddenly I'm this little skinny 16-year-old schoolgirl who's suddenly flying first class around the world, being photographed by Richard Avedon, meeting Andy Warhol and being called the face of that era. So it was extraordinary. The Hollywood establishment had no idea what to make of the shocking fashion phenomenon. Hollywood was really quite out of the picture when the youth quake first burst on the world. Hollywood was mired in a system which had been established decades before and was very much made by older men who didn't really have any grasp of what youth culture was like. Here they are! The new youth culture may have puzzled Hollywood at first, but when British rock bands began appearing on the silver screen and sparking a massive British cinematic invasion... So this is the famous Beatles. We need protection. Get me protection. Hollywood's puzzlement turned to panic. The clothes have changed. The dialogue's been rewritten. American teenagers flocked to the movie theaters to see a whole new breed of British film stars. Julie Christie, Susanna York, and David Hemmings introduced American moviegoers to outrageous styles that wowed teenagers. 
and trendy British films like Smashing Time transported Americans to swinging London and Carnaby Street, the shopping thoroughfare at the center of England's style revolution. Smashing Time is a brilliant movie that pastiches the 60s and makes fun of everything being tuned in, turned on, pacey. And they use they exaggerate all the ling the lingo that was used at the time. This will be just a party. This will be the greatest trip since Noah's Ark. Listen, we'll have the whole of turned on London. PROs, teleproducers, gangsters, pop stars, paperback writers, MBEs. It'll be the spadiest freak out of all time. The queen of swinging London's fashion craze and the unseen star of many of the trendiest English films of the mod era was Mary Quant, the mother of the miniskirt. I was designing directly for the clothes I wanted for uh, someone who you know, wanted to not only have a job but run, dance and be and exist. It's a kind of, kind of wow, look at me. Isn't life great and isn't it wonderful to be female? Quant was one of the first of an army of trendy, youth-oriented designers to be snapped up for the British screen. Her clothes were the main attraction of fashion vehicles like Georgie Girl, which saw a glamorous Charlotte Rampling in Quant, leaving frumpy Lynn Redgrave dated and dateless. If you look at a film like Georgie Girl, um, the skirts were really only just above the knee, but it was kind of shocking to see it with knee socks and a little flat and it was that kind of that naughtiness that comes from a grown woman looking like a little girl this look was very much london but once seen of course it took america all of three weeks to have grown their hair if they were male or had it cut if they were female another british mod sensation blow up brought the fashion revolution to the big screen in irresistible style david hemmings has this great you know sort of you know groovy um, hipster guy look, which really consists of just, you know, really narrow um, white pants, chino pants, the best small suede boots, and, and uh, it works. It's great. People probably watched Blow Up and really felt like that was what was going on with mod clothing. At first, Hollywood dug its head in the sand and ignored the mod movement. I think if you were an Adrian or Irene fan, it was very alienating to see this emergence of youthful fashion. Suddenly, it wasn't about shoulder pads and wasp waists. It was uh, about sexy macrame halter tops. I think that the Hollywood movies were, were, were slow to take up on this initially because they, the, the filmmakers were very conservative. And, and, of course, a lot of people thought it wouldn't last. But the miniskirt did not go away, as many of the movie industry's old guard designers had hoped it would. Instead, many of them disappeared. A lot of people really dropped out of the picture. Helen Rose, for example, just gave up. Jean-Louis did keep working. But the pictures became fewer and fewer. The mod revolution was such a powerful force that it threatened to wreck the Hollywood fashion machine that had set trends and sold tickets for half a century. This was the wave of the future, and it would come sweeping along and push everything else out of the way. By 1965, Hollywood was in a full-fledged fashion crisis. Having dominated style for 50 years, it found itself and its costume designers on the wrong side of a massive generation gap, as well as the wrong side of the Atlantic Ocean. Britain ruled the fashion waves, and the young were demanding Mary Quant, not Edith Head. When we return, Hollywood's costume designers confront a stark choice. Get hip, or face fashion extinction. As the mods revolutionize the very concept of style, the old guard Hollywood fashion machine came crashing down. No longer the style leader of the world, Hollywood scrambled to catch up with the times any way it could, leaving many of its traditional costume designers in the dust. London is all shook up by a rock and roll fashion show of the latest Carnaby Street gear. Even though Hollywood's traditional designers steadfastly ignored the constantly changing trends pouring in from Carnaby Street, the studios were eager to cash in on Maud's profit-making power. My name's Bond, James Bond. One of the most influential Maud imports was the new icon of the stylish British playboy, epitomized by James Bond. Hollywood was quick to Americanize the super cool, super spy in a horde of campy spoofs. 
I'm the new secret weapon. Oh, so do I look like an enemy agent? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen all the latest models yet. Homegrown spies like Matt Helm and Derek Flynn combined Bond's sleek appeal with the most outlandish mod fashions and hit box office bonanza. The 60s are filled with swanky playboys. Of course, James Coburn immediately leaps to mind. Our man Flint lives it up like mad. Private barber, personal valet. As our man Flint, you know, he's always impeccably tailored in really, really great sharkskin suits with, you know, sort of narrow lapels and great fits. As far as the clothes, the idea was that the hero was Mr. Smooth, Mr. Cool, Mr. Suave, and so he was to look at all times like the playboy hero that every man was supposed to want to be. But when Hollywood wanted to borrow mod images, it often had to borrow trend-setting Europeans to create them. French couturier Yves Saint Laurent was recruited to bring chic sophistication to the Pink Panther. Oleg Cassini's eye-popping continental fashions adorned Matt Helm's gorgeous spy girls in the ambushers. And British mod designer Kiki Byrne whipped up the saucy outfits for Raquel Welch in Fathom. Feast your eyes on Fathom. When she slips on her bikini, clips on her grenade earring, things really happen. Well, there was a lot of legs. There was a lot of very short skirts, and then there was a lot of bikinis. And then you had so much hair that you couldn't move your head, and you had so many eyelashes on that you could hardly <laughs> keep your eyes open. So it was pretty funny, really. For a few years, it seemed that the only American filmmakers who really dug youth culture were those outside the mainstream. The father of pop art, Andy Warhol, pushed way out style to the limit in his avant-garde films. And soft-born king Russ Meyer was quick to exploit the sex appeal of mod fashions in now classic cult films like Faster Pussycat, Kill Kill, and Super Vixens. In The Spy Who Shagged Me, we um, looked at some of the Russ Meyer films, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. It was also a very sexy film. It was certainly a lot about, uh, there was a lot of cleavage, which um, we kind of borrowed. But now Hollywood faced a revolution from within. A rising new generation of young movie stars began demanding that if the established studio designers couldn't get hip, Hollywood had better make room for designers who could. Enter Theodora Van Runkel, one of the first of a whole new generation of young designers to elbow her way into the industry. Van Runkel had to fight an entrenched studio system that saw her as a threat. They were conservative, really conservative places. And I used to like to dress very far out. I made life really tough for myself because the people would not approve of me. I'm Miss Bonnie Parker, and this here's Mr. Clyde Barrow. We rob banks. With her premiere film, Bonnie and Clyde, Van Runkle launched Hollywood's first bona fide fashion craze in years. Good afternoon, this is the Barrow Gang. Her 1967 designs for Bonnie and Clyde played a profound role in the history of pop styles as they evolved from mid-60s mod to late-60s hippie, even though the story was set in the mid-30s depression. Although it's ostensibly all set, in the 30s with 30s clothes it reflects contemporary fashion and it influenced contemporary fashion bonnie and clyde remains the cinematic landmark in 60s style and put hollywood back on the fashion map not only did faye dunaway's beret become a staple but her long dresses inspired the first serious competitor to the so far unstoppable miniskirt the maxi skirt came from bonnie and clyde there were so many designers then that were influenced, and they dubbed it the Maxi. The Maxi skirt was suddenly all the rage, and Hollywood was ecstatic, believing it had regained its rightful role as the arbiter of fashion, the dictator of skirt lengths. But Van Runkle herself knew that this newfound power was an illusion. The Maxi skirt became just one of several options in skirt lengths. Bonnie and Clyde represented freedom. When women were allowed to wear the Maxi skirt, they had a certain kind of freedom. They felt like they were Bonnie. And women that wore the mini had another kind of freedom. They were free to show off their legs, and men were free to enjoy their legs. There hasn't been a designated skirt length 
film. While Bonnie and Clyde failed to return Hollywood to its old position as fashion dictator, it did open the door for Van Runkel and other new inventive designers. Van Runkel again collaborated with Faye Dunaway to work fashion magic in the Thomas Crown Affair. Combining Hollywood elegance and mod cheekiness, Van Runkel dressed the sophisticated Dunaway in an endless parade of whimsical, daring ensembles. I like to make little skirts that would flip when she walked because she had such darling legs and everything. Van Runkel intrinsically understood 60s fashion and brought her own personal sense of style to stars like Steve McQueen in Bullet. I fixed him up to look like my then boyfriend who I was just obsessed with. <laughs> and apparently it worked. <laughs> Other new costume designers emerged to revel in the fun of mod styles ignored by the old guard. Bob Mackey's young partner, Ray Agian, who turned James Coburn into a playboy fantasy in the Flint movies, also made Doris Day groovy in Caprice. And the youthful Jack Bear brought the comedy of the generation gap to the party. You know, there's really little reality between what they're wearing and what they're doing, you know. And that's half the fun. It's really style for style's sake. Still reeling from the loss of its trend-setting power, Hollywood managed to save itself from fashion oblivion by letting in a new generation of hip designers. But now, Hollywood is in for an even bigger surprise as mods give way to hippies. And the same young people who once demanded Carnaby Street fashion now turn their back on fashion altogether. With the success of Bonnie and Clyde, American movies showed that they still had at least some trend-setting power. But outside the orbit of Hollywood, the world was changing in ways that would alter the course of fashion forever. By 1969, the playful optimism of America's youth culture disappeared under the weight of the Vietnam War, race riots, and the drug movement. The mod moment was over. Everything changed because people refused to obey fashion arbiters anymore. And they all started to adopt the, the hippies' anti-fashion ethos. I should dress to please myself, not other people. To the baby boom generation now steeped in war and social chaos, mod fashion suddenly seemed as plastic and contrived as an Adrian gown or a Max Factor makeover. They weren't going to hold still for backcombing their hair and spraying it to death and, and uh, perfectly coordinated clothes. Who cares? Nobody cares anymore. Costume and fashion is saying, I have better things on my mind. Here they are, the hippies, the psychedelic dropouts. As the hippie revolution swept the world, Hollywood itself began to experience a profound change, not only in fashion, but across the board. The old-time moguls and directors who had invented the motion picture industry and its ideas of glamour were finally dying off. You do your own thing in your own time. Groundbreaking films like Easy Rider introduced a radical new generation of filmmakers, many of them hippies themselves. Significant that Easy Rider was made by people outside the Hollywood system because they were really able to tap into an understanding of what this subculture was about. But the so-called New Hollywood had little use for high fashion. It was the younger generation saying, they're not going to play the game. We're going to invent our own game. What are you doing screwing around with all this? As Hollywood embraced realism and grunge, Fashion leadership began to bypass movie stars altogether. The fashion industry lost its traditional cinematic icons and responded by elevating models into major celebrities, eventually paving the way for the supermodels of the 1980s. An actress is stopped being glamorous. So suddenly the glamorous women wearing the gorgeous clothes were models. But by the end of the 70s, nostalgia for the 60s had begun to take hold and mod styles, which had dated so quickly, began to make a comeback. The 60s was already being revived in the 70s, only a few years after it disappeared, because it had such a powerful appeal. The mod revival that sparked to life on high fashion runways in the late 70s and 80s became ablaze by the mid-90s. The 
we look at Tom Ford's breakthrough collection for Gucci, it was a total Chelsea look. We look at designers like Anna Sui or Isaac Mizrahi, and they always have a little bit of a 60s vibe. This revival hit the big screen in the 90s and reached its peak in Austin Powers. Come on, babies, work with me, people, all right. A runaway success that touched a nerve and took style cues from the most imaginative moments of a forward-thinking age. Austin Powers designer Dina Appel drew from many sources. The Bond films, the, um, the Avengers, even um, the Ambushers, the Matt Helm series. Um, and like Flint, films like Danger Diabolique, which was extraordinary um, visually. The fashion was almost, almost wearable today. And the cool invoked by Austin Powers and the spy who shagged me has been mimicked both by fashion designers and by a long line of remakes and 60s influenced films with fashions that nod back to the groovy decade. The Avengers, the Mod Squad, and the Thomas Crown Affair all echo aspects of a time when fashion really swung. People of my generation love movies that reference the 60s, and um, it was a period when we were coming of age, so costume designers jump at the chance to refer to that period, be it the mod part of it, the mid-60s, or the late 60s, the hippie era. It's something that resonates for people of my generation. And for the younger generation as well. I've got a daughter who's nearly 21. She never lets me forget that I gave most of my mini skirts and bell bottoms away but I always say but darling I was 18 years old I had no idea I was going to give birth to you in 10 years and you'd want all my clothes in 30 I mean it's hysterical because it has gone full circle but fashion does that today's cutting-edge designers love to harken back to the 60s I think we have sort of a nostalgia fascination as a society we love to look back um, and I think there's a, there's a comfort level in looking back. I think we love to glamorize periods. I mean, we've glamorized the 30s, we've glamorized the 40s. I think we're far enough away from the 60s now that it's become an era to glamorize. Just so colorful and so delightful and so full of promise. For some reason, if you have freedom in what you dress, life just seems to open up for you and anything can happen, you know, and it just... I just think it's fabulous. Yeah, baby! <laughs> the mod 60s arrived in theaters with a bang, sweeping away traditional style and smashing the fashion machine of old Hollywood. But for those who think of the shagadelic 60s as the death knell of glamour, the passing of time shows just the opposite. A glorious, exuberant moment that seemed decidedly anti-fashion back then now seems timelessly fresh and forever young.